Hello and welcome everybody to the Future Tech Week. My name is Eric Prem. I'm the director of Utima and a partner in the FatFX project organizing the Future Tech Week events in collaboration with the European Innovation Council pilot. The Future Tech Week 2020 fosters communication around visionary, high-risk and long-term impact research and emerging technological trends funded by the European Commission under EIC Pathfinder FET as a driver for future breakthrough innovation. The Future Tech Week in this year is an online event to celebrate the EIC Pathfinder FET program. Now, the FET program has been around for over three decades and I think it has gained a reputation for its leading edge research focus, but it is also a program that focuses on longer term technology developments in many areas of science and technology. And as such, it is a highly ambitious and competitive program funded by the European Commission. It is therefore a particular honor to welcome Professor Moser to his special talk for the Future Tech Week in 2014, Professor Moser and colleagues received the Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine for their work on grid cells. And I'm excited that Professor Moser will be giving us a short introduction in his work, especially because Professor Moser was also involved in a FED project in a leading role. And the project focused on furthering our understanding of grid cells and also investigated how these newly discovered neurophysiological principles could be used for developing new technologies, for example, for robot navigation. Now, I hope this was an appropriate introduction in the work of Professor Moser. Uh, so I'm looking forward to your own short explanation, Professor Moser, for the next 20 minutes or so, and then we'll have a short question and answer session. Thank you, Professor Moser very much. So I appreciate very much the introduction. I think it was fairly accurate. So uh, what I will do then, as you uh, indicated, is to share with you some experiences from uh, the FET project uh, that I was involved in. So let me just share the screen now. And uh, now you should see the uh, file. So here, uh, this is uh, then uh, this is my uh, uh, 10, 15, 20 minute summary of uh, a project that uh, took place from 2013 to 2017 under the funding or under the scheme of the FET Proactive Grid Map uh, uh, project that, was, that it was called. So, uh, uh, okay. So, um, so uh, the participant of this uh, project, it was four groups. So uh, first of them, uh, I was the coordinator uh, working at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. Uh, I worked together with three other groups. Uh, one was a neuroscience group from the University of Edinburgh, uh, head, headed by Richard Morris. And uh, uh, then in addition, we had a computational neuroscience group from CISA in Italy from the International School of Advanced Studies. And finally, a technology group from uh, the Technical University of Munich in Germany. And these three groups then spanning the range from basic science on the brain to techno technological uh, innovation headed towards uh, trying at least to uh, learn from the brain um, and uh, ex ex to um, extract information from the brain that could possibly be used to actually improve computers and particularly robots. So um, let me begin, begin with uh, some uh, background. So uh, the starting point was uh, the invention of computers and computers have been around for, uh, for at least uh, 80 years now but um, although they have totally dominated our own field uh, or uh, everyday work of everyone in the world 
it is still the case, or at least was certainly the case at the time when we started, that uh, computers are still extremely good at speed and power. So computers are excellent for performing precisely pre-instructed operations on large sets of data and doing this extremely rapidly, exceeding what humans can do completely. But it's still the case, and was definitely the case when we started the project, that um, computers still uh, had some challenges when it came to doing many, many different uh, things and tasks at the same time, and uh, especially when the tasks were ambiguous. And this is uh, the case just in everyday situations that we as humans and all animals experience all the time. Lots of things is going on in the environment around us. We have to focus our attention, but still process uh, many, many channels, what different people do at the same time as I'm speaking, for example, um, planning the next steps of my talk, and also uh, being distracted of whatever I hear from the neighboring room at this time, and doing all of this at the same time at a very high speed. So computers haven't been so good at handling this uh, in, uh, in parallel and interactively uh, until quite recently. And uh, for that reason, one of the aims of the project was then to try to find out what is actually the brain doing? What are the computations that uh, brains are doing that, uh, that uh, actually uh, help us uh, uh, do this so fast and so efficiently and with so little error? So um, um, we wanted to learn from the brain uh, the brain, the nature's most uh, advanced computer, and see if it could extract any information that possibly could be uh, uh, used to develop better computers in the future. And then particularly, we focused on, uh, on the cortex, which is uh, the outer sheet of the cerebrum, which is the main part of the brain. And this outer sheet is then uh, shown in gray uh, around here, is there when, uh, where we think that most of the intellectual activity takes place. So let's then focus on one of the functions that uh, takes place in the uh, cortex of the human brain. And that is, uh, that is uh, the ability to find one's way. So the brain's spatial mapping system, it, it is about how to find one's way, how to, uh, how to know where you are, and how to get from there to other places. So very simple in a sense, we do this all the time, both humans and all animals are completely dependent on doing this in order to survive, in order to find food, in order to find a mate and so on. Um, but uh, still, um, it is only very recently that we have learned about this system. And uh, in fact, we have learned more about this system than many or even most other uh, high level brain functions uh, uh, of humans. So what you see here is a human brain. Um, you see the temporal lobe on the side here and in red, this is uh, shows an area called the hippocampus. It's actually inside the brain. So it's sort of folded into the, into the brain and into the cortex. And then next to it, you have another area shown here in blue, which is called the entorhinal cortex. And those are two important parts of the cortex that I want to focus on now. And the reason is that these two areas are so important for the navigation system and in particular for helping us to map our own location. And um, why focus on this? Well, for this project, the whole reason is that here we do at least understand, understand some of the underlying computations that take place. And we thought that uh, we might perhaps extract some of those uh, to the benefit of, uh, uh, of techno technological innovations. However, this is a human brain and that's very complicated uh, structure. So we think that we can uh, actually benefit from uh, from learning um, or extracting information from animal brains and then in particular rats and mice 
So there's a long history of uh, studies in rats and mice, uh, and particularly when it comes to navigation or finding one's way, which these animals are extremely good at. And um, using uh, rats and mice as uh, modern species has actually taught us the most of what we know about uh, space and navigation in the brain. So we focused on rats, and uh, it is possible in rats, has been done for about 50 years, to actually record activity from their brains as they are performing behaviors. So this shows a rat, or it could also be a mouse, running around in a small box where it can localize small pieces of chocolate, which they like, and that makes them run around all the time. And at the same time, it is possible to plug a small device, small sensors, uh, to a connector on their brain so that we can record from activity in their brains while they are through a cable here, it can also be wireless to a computer and then it's possible to pick up the electrical signals that underlie uh, the activity of um, the entorhinal cortex and the hippocampus as the rat is running around. So what's going on in cells in this brain area as the rat is uh, finding its way in this box. So um, we recorded them from the entorhinal cortex of uh, rats and mice. So in, in 2005, then, then we made our biggest breakthrough probably, and which also uh, was used as a motivation for the, the Nobel Prize in uh, 2014, and namely the discovery of uh, grid cells. So in the entorhinal cortex, we found that there are cells that have uh, uh, localized spatial firing and that fire in a periodic hexagonal pattern. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's now consider this um, uh, rat or mouse that's running around in this box. And then let's uh, look at uh, down here, you have a picture from an overhead camera that shows in gray the trace of the rat as it's running around in the box over a period of half an hour. So it's almost visited every possible place. And then in black, each black dot shows um, a position where one particular cell was active. It means that that cell fired an action potential, as we call it, to sent an impulse to other cells in the brain. And you can so see that the activity of uh, this particular cell in the entorhinal cortex was not random. It occurred when the rat was at particular places and those places formed a very um, regular periodic pattern. So you can see it appeared in dots, clusters, and those clusters formed a hexagonal pattern that spread all the way over the recording box. And I can show that uh, in a different example here. So what you see here is, uh, a uh, different cell, but now I put uh, red lines on top of it, and you can see that uh, this is just to illustrate that it's a triangular or hexagonal pattern that repeats itself all over the surface of the environment. So this is a grid that covers the entire environment. Each cell shows a grid that covers the environment, and for that reason we call these cells grid cells. And uh, because these cells contain a metric, information about distance and direction, and is based on the animals running around in the environment, then this in many ways serves as an internal GPS of the brain. Um, and although we don't really call it a GPS, I mean, that's very often used as an analogy when people try to explain the workings of these cells to a broader public. So, that was the background. That was uh, the, the situation when uh, we decided that we wanted to, uh, to apply for this project. And uh, then, uh, why did we apply? Well, it was because these grid cells, they, uh, they uh, are among the first uh, non-sensory -sensory cognitive high-end functions that uh, um, the brain um, has that have been understood in some detail mechanistically. So we wanted to exploit this window into a high level area of the brain and then ask if this could be used to actually improve uh, computers uh, and in particular computers that uh, navigate in the environment. And, uh, and uh, the aims are then shown down here. 
So uh, it's a three-step objective for the project. First, we wanted to determine the mechanisms by which space is represented. So how does this brain area work? And especially in realistic settings, which was necessary for, uh, in order to bridge, um, bridge the gap over to technological uh, applications such as robots. Then we wanted to use these insights to infer the computational algorithms that uh, this brain area uses. And then finally, with the help of having these computational algorithms, we then wanted to see if they could be applied to, uh, to uh, instruments like computers and in particular robotic agents that navigate around in the world. So could we help machines to navigate using the principles that the brain has invented millions of years ago? And uh, here are some of the outcomes of the projects at a broad level. So first of all, um, we did uh, during these years uh, find out a lot about the mechanisms of this uh, grid pattern. We found out uh, uh, how the pattern is wired and what causes this uh, hexagonal pattern to uh, be created. I'm not going into the details of that because that requires a lot more time, but we found that a lot can be explained by the interactions between many, many cells in this brain area, the way they work together and the hexagonal pattern of firing in many ways is uh, an equi equilibrium state that the neural circuit arrives at under certain conditions. And then this hexagonal map is then updated as animals move around in the environment and reflects the animal's position and uh, can be used to infer actually where in the environment the animal is. So um, we extended, as I said, this to um, more realistic environments than just running in a box. We made complicated boxes with different rooms and walls and uh, try to simulate at least environments that are more similar to uh, indoor environments where some robots uh, move around and then of course ultimately uh, environments out in nature. By, uh, and we did that by adding additional features, borders, walls, uh, blockades, and so how does this affect the grid cells? How do they operate in such more realistic uh, situations that we need to understand if we want to extend this to a robotic system. And then at the next step, uh, we uh, also saw that uh, this actually happened several places in this entorhinal cortex area. There were different circuits that computed space or location at the same time on their own and uh, operated at least to some extent independently in a modular way. So a classical example of a parallel processing that might also be interesting for the development of uh, next generation computers. And then importantly, uh, we established and developed models to try to explain what was going on because these explanations are necessary if we are to bridge the gap over to uh, applications. We need the rules or the laws or the computations that we can then can apply in a machine in order to see if they can operate in the same way. And we did that. We, uh, uh, together with our partner in, uh, at the Technical University in Munich, we developed a test arena for robotic experiments. He developed robots that moved around on the floor in his lab and trying to do so and to find places based on uh, rules that were actually developed from what we uh, thought we had extracted from the uh, mouse or rat brains as they moved around. And finally, uh, I think perhaps the most important here is that uh, the development of proof of principle demonstrations that such algorithms can actually be exploited to um, create technical innovations that uh, in, in some ways can be uh, better or hopefully in, be much better than the applications um, that uh, uh, are a state of the art. And then let me just uh, 
finish by uh, summing up uh, what I think is a general impact of uh, this uh, project. So uh, first of all, uh, it continued to make uh, a huge influence on uh, neuroscience and uh, uh, particularly I think uh, it helped us understand um, two things. First, how is this grid pattern created? So it's a major computation of uh, of the brain and one that could be quantified and could be effectively modeled. And we also uh, managed to try to adapt these uh, insights to real, more realistic environments where you bounce into things and have to make detours and shortcuts and try to understand how uh, could the brain actually take these things into account in order to compute the most efficient uh, path to uh, a goal. And in that process, uh, then I think actually the, the most important element of the project was the contribution to the growth of computational neuroscience. So computational neuroscience is a branch of neuroscience that has become increasingly important because it tries to describe the operations of the brain at an algorithmic level. What are the rules, the laws, the computations that take place among neurons that uh, actually result in a certain function, such as the creation of an internal updated map. And uh, then having these algorithms available, then uh, we at least took some steps towards using those for creating technology, robotic implementations that navigated around in the environment and and also use some of these parallel or modular computations that we saw taking place in uh, the grid cell system of rats and mice and, uh, and uh, we know what also happen in, uh, in the human brain. So uh, I think this bridge from basic neuroscience through computational neuroscience towards application this is perhaps uh, it was the goal of the project and is also where i think the project left a uh, contribution of course it's a long way to go uh, because uh, the brain is still a big mystery we only have a few windows into understanding its underlying computations but i mean uh, using the insights from the brain can i think in many ways be uh, uh, a stepping stone towards uh, creating better machines, intelligent robots. And uh, it's not always the case that the brain has the best solution, but quite often uh, evolution has found ways that we could learn from as we cr uh, uh, create uh, tomorrow's computer. And that's the long-term benefit for society, for sure, I would think. So uh, I think with that, I'll just... Uh, Thank you for the attention. It was a brief presentation, but hopefully you got the, at least the gist of uh, the project. Thank you. Now I'll just stop sharing then, and then I, we are back at the, uh, uh, at the, with both of us in the, in the mainframe. Thank you so much, Professor Moza. Fascinating work, uh, and, and thanks also for the, for the uh, let's say, um, relatively lightweight uh, introduction into neuroscience. Um, I can tell you that from a computer science background, uh, this is all very fascinating. It, and um, computer scientists tend to be hugely impressed with, with studying brains um, because of this, from a computer science perspective, so much is going on in parallel. I mean, everything's going on in parallel. Yes. There's this massive firing of neurons. And I would actually like to say that a GPS is fairly uh, simple compared yeah. to, to, to what's going on in the brain. Um, because the problem is, you in a computer, you have a single processor that follows instructions. You can write down numbers. But how do we achieve the same function in this large network of, of, of neurons that are interconnected is far from trivial, even mathematically. It's not easy to see how the brain does these wonderful things. No, it's and still it's amazing. And, and it's also yeah. not only that these things go in parallel in many systems, but they interact all the time. That's a really, really complicated thing. So it's all dependent on each other. <laughs> yes. 
It's a very, it's a very good point. And computer scientists always try to limit these interactions. You know, we always yes. write functions with very clear interfaces, yes. so it's not to have any of those interactions in, in yes. our <laughs> opposite of, of what you're trying to do here. But on the other hand, uh, when we look uh, into nature, I mean, um, I mean, ev all living systems, or at least animals, all they do is they move bodies through environments. So it is to be expected that, that a large part of the brain, and indeed very old systems of the brain, do exactly this, and they probably do it in a very good and robust manner. They navigate bodies through space. Yeah. So, and, and, and if you think that we still do not fully understand this, it's not surprising that our robots are still a little bit brittle and, and far from being robust. <laughs> Yeah, no, I have still a way to go. And I think at the moment, that's our challenge. I mean, you can, you can uh, create robots that solve uh, this in completely different ways than the brain, just using a sensor that then uh, recognizes what you see on the image, uh, similar to the retina. Uh, but I think there are, uh, you, don't, you will still then face these challenges of uh, taking so many things into account. And uh, so I, I think... Uh, it is, um, I mean, we can learn a lot uh, from robots. Uh, I think starting with a GPS is uh, a, a place to start because it is so simple, as you say. And then, but hopefully then by revealing these, these algorithms of the brain that can actually be used for much more complicated processes in the end. And especially when we understand these parallel computations and also the interactions between many systems. But let me ask you one question then, uh, maybe a level higher. So, I mean, science is all about um, understanding uh, nature and technology is very much about building things. Yes. Um, and, and well, and innovation goes one step further. It's about selling things. Yes. Um, so so what's, your, what's your take on this? How important is this, um, this, this characteristics also of the FED projects where you're trying to, to really... Uh, combine the two. Do, do you, is this is this a good way of doing research? I think uh, science, basic science and technology are totally interdependent. So uh, and it goes both ways. So first of all, I think technology uh, technological development is always dependent on uh, on knowledge about how things work. And I, I think we see this just now in in the era of the pandemic. I mean, developing a vaccine so fast can be done because we know how the immune system works. We know what a virus is like, and uh, we can create uh, a vaccine that operates on the right target of a virus. Uh, and all this happened almost within weeks in the beginning, just designing the appropriate target. And this is because there's basic knowledge about uh, the human body and about uh, viral agents and it's the same for uh, the brain or anything else uh, that uh, we need this basic knowledge then we can apply it but it also goes the other way around because a major limitation for for example neuroscience and many sciences is uh, the availability of technology so the brain is so small it's so many computational units spread over the entire brain that picking up that little activity has always been a challenge and there new technologies are the driving force. So technology also influences science again, but I think it's a bi-directional relationship. And what I liked about the FET program is that you have to think far ahead uh, and not only take the next steps. And that is what these uh, projects do. They don't always lead to major breakthroughs within a three or four year funding period, but just getting people on that track to look far forward, that is really what is important for, for development. And that's not only for science, that's also for technological development. I believe this is a very important point. So you're, you're saying um, it is indeed, like FED does, worth looking a little bit further ahead, even in technology development, not everything. Although we are talking, we're still interested in, in innovation. But it's not around the corner. It's it's about some more fundamental changes here. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Okay. Um, now let me let me close this this um, um, meeting with a with a more personal um, question. 
Um, how has being a Nobel laureate changed your life? Uh, I mean, <laughs> I'm grateful you found the time, but uh, we all imagine, uh, you know, a Nobel laureate being uh, uh, only invited to, to talks and, and not being able to do any more research. Uh, it's a way to, to kick uh, out. Something. Yeah, yeah, you, you hit the point there because uh, uh, when you get the Nobel Prize, then your life changes in the sense that you become some sort of ambassador for science too. You speak out about things and people listen to you. But uh, I mean, these things, uh, not only going to talks, but also doing science policy and uh, fighting for science funding, uh, that all takes a lot of time. So that, and it's an important job, but I also try to balance it still uh, very actively. Uh, towards uh, maintaining a lab and a lab that is at the forefront of the field still and having uh, lots of good people in it and if I want to have these lots of good people working in the lab they will only come if uh, the lab still is at the international forefront so uh, it is a difficult balance I'm fighting with that all the time but uh, I still think that doing my science, finding out how the brain works is still my highest priority. <laughs> and, I, and I hope you are still able to squeeze in a little bit of technology as well and, and uh, not just uh, science. Oh, definitely. So we are now at a point where uh, there's actually another technological revolution taking place in the brain sciences, which is that uh, until quite recently, uh, people and uh, including myself we recorded a few cells at the same time that's all we could do um, but now uh, you can have thousands of cells at the same time and why is that important well it's because uh, all these complex uh, functions like finding your way and thinking planning memory that's all about interactions between large numbers of cells that work together and if you are to understand that we have to monitor the activity of all of them and play with them, turn some on, turn others off. And you can't really do that until uh, you have a totally different technology. That technology with the probes for recording many, many cells and even uh, trying to perturb them uh, in certain ways, uh, that is now becoming available. And uh, for that reason, I think there's another revolution now going on, which uh, uh, brings neuroscience to the neural population level, where you look at thousands of cells at the same time. Brilliant. Many thanks. I, I think, Professor Moser, this was a, a brilliant uh, way to kick off the future tech week. Uh, and uh, I think it demonstrates how important this relation between science, technology and innovation can be and, and how important it is having programs such as FED also in the future when it's moving over to, to EIC. Uh, as, as Pathfinder. Yeah. I cross my fingers for that and hope that these programs will uh, not only continue to exist, but they will get higher priority. So uh, good luck with the future Tech Week. Thank you so much.